It's the winter of 1784, somewhere deep in the Ohio wilderness. A 29-year-old frontiersman named Simon Kenton crouches motionless in the darkness, waiting for dawn. The temperature has dropped to 20 degrees below zero. He's been sitting like this for six hours, rifle across his lap, completely still, so he doesn't alert the deer he'll hunt at first light. He has no tent, no sleeping bag, just a wool blanket wrapped around his shoulders and a small hole he dug in the ground before sunset. When dawn finally breaks and he stands up to hunt, there are two inches of fresh snow covering his blanket. But here's the thing that would have killed most men in his situation. He had no idea it even snowed. Underneath that blanket, Simon Kenton was warm, not just surviving the cold, but genuinely comfortable through a blizzard that should have frozen him to death. The technique he used wasn't something he invented. An old trapper named John Yeager had taught it to him. Eleven years earlier, when Simon was just a fugitive teenager fleeing into the Kentucky wilderness. And Jaeger, he learned it from men who learned it from men who learned it from centuries of soldiers who survived the coldest period in European history. What you're about to learn is an 800-year-old fire technique that burned for 18 hours on a single load of wood, produced almost zero visible smoke, and kept men alive in conditions that kill modern preppers with all their expensive gear. But before I show you exactly how it works, you need to understand where it came from and why we forgot something so valuable. Medieval origins. Medieval Europe between 1200 and 1400 had a warfare problem that had nothing to do with weapons and everything to do with survival. Knights campaigned through enemy territory for months at a time. Scouts slipped into hostile lands to gather intelligence. Soldiers laid siege to castles through winters that lasted half the year, and all of them faced the same potentially fatal dilemma. How do you stay warm without announcing your position to everyone within five miles? A campfire solves the cold problem instantly, but it creates two problems that can get you killed even faster. Flames are visible for incredible distances in darkness. Smoke rises in columns that enemy scouts can spot from miles away during daylight. If you're in enemy territory and you light a normal fire, you might as well send up a signal flare announcing exactly where you are. Medieval armies needed heat without visibility, warmth without smoke, the ability to survive cold that could kill you in hours while remaining completely hidden from enemies who would kill you in minutes. This wasn't a comfort issue. This was the difference between completing your mission and dying before you even engaged the enemy. What they discovered through generations of trial and error was something that modern preppers with all their expensive gear have completely forgotten. Certain types of bark burned in fundamentally different ways than wood. Oak bark specifically, and white oak even more specifically, had three properties that made it almost perfect for concealed fires. First, it produced heat comparable to coal, somewhere around 8,000 BTUs per pound. That's significantly more than regular firewood. Second, the coals lasted for hours instead of burning out in minutes like normal wood. Third, and this is the critical part, white oak bark contains very little resin or sap. Resin is what creates thick smoke when wood burns. Without it, you get clean combustion that produces almost no visible smoke. But the real genius wasn't just using oak bark, it was burning it underground. The technique itself was remarkably simple which is probably why it survived for centuries as oral tradition rather than written instruction. You'd dig a hole roughly the size of your head, about a foot deep in soft earth. The bottom would be layered with dry bark pieces arranged in a crisscross pattern so air could flow between them. You'd start a small fire with kindling and let it burn down to glowing red coals. Then you'd add more bark pieces, let those coal up as well. And here's where medieval soldiers made the breakthrough that changed everything. You'd cover the entire fire with the dirt you'd removed from the hole, but before burying it completely, you'd insert two sticks into the coals, one on each side. Once the dirt was packed down around them, you'd carefully pull the sticks out, leaving two small air holes that allowed oxygen to reach the coals below. Without those air holes, the fire suffocates and dies. With them, it burns steadily for 12 to 18 hours on a single load of bark. The ground becomes insulation that traps heat, instead of letting it escape into cold air. The coals provide steady radiant warmth rather than flickering flames that announce your presence. The smoke, what little exists, dissipates through the soil rather than rising in a column visible for miles. 
Medieval soldiers would sit directly over this underground fire with their blanket wrapped around them, creating what they called a little room. The heat rose straight into their enclosed space while remaining completely invisible from 50 feet away. No light, no smoke, no indication anyone was there. You could sit over this fire for hours, even sleep sitting up, staying genuinely warm through nights that killed men who tried to survive with just their cloaks. If you're learning something genuinely useful here, hit that like button. This wasn't something nobles wrote about in castle libraries or military commanders included in training manuals. This was survival knowledge passed from veteran soldiers to recruits, from experienced scouts to new ones, from fathers to sons. For generations, this technique saved lives during campaigns that would have otherwise ended in frozen corpses scattered across enemy territory. And then, like so much practical knowledge that requires skill rather than resources, it started disappearing. But that disappearance created a gap in history that makes what happened next even more fascinating. Because this technique didn't actually die, it was waiting in the wilderness for someone who needed it desperately enough. The Lost Century by the early 1600s, warfare had changed in ways that made old survival techniques seem unnecessary. Gunpowder had transformed how armies fought. Instead of mobile campaigns deep in enemy territory, battles centered around fortified positions where supplies could be stockpiled. Coal became cheap and abundant across Europe. Firewood was something you could buy rather than something you had to carefully ration. The techniques that required genuine skill, the ones that had been passed down orally for generations, started to seem quaint. Why learn to make an 18-hour underground fire when you could just throw another log on the pile? Resources replaced knowledge, money replaced expertise. The underground fire technique didn't disappear completely. It went underground in more ways than one. Mountain trappers still knew variations of it. Some rural communities preserved fragments of the knowledge. But written records, those barely existed. The few mentions in historical documents are so vague they're almost useless for actually reconstructing the technique. This is what happens when practical survival knowledge isn't valued enough to be formally preserved. It becomes folklore. It becomes that thing the old timers knew how to do. It becomes a memory of a memory until eventually it's just gone, lost to a world that decided printed manuals and purchased supplies were superior to hard won experience. But here's what makes this story fascinating. That knowledge didn't actually die. It was waiting in the wilderness for the right person to need it badly enough. Simon Kenton's rediscovery. In 1771, a 16-year-old boy named Simon Kenton beat a man nearly to death in a fight over a girl. Believing he'd committed murder, he fled his Virginia home and disappeared into the wilderness that would become West Virginia, Kentucky and Ohio. For years, he traveled under the name Simon Butler, learning to survive in conditions that killed most men who tried to make a life on the frontier. By 1773, he'd made his way to Kentucky, where he met a frontiersman named John Yeager near the mouth of the Elk River. Yeager was the kind of man the wilderness produces, someone who understood that knowledge was more valuable than any tool you could carry. That winter, he taught young Simon techniques that would keep him alive for the next 40 years of frontier life. The underground fire was one of those techniques. Jaeger's version had small differences from what medieval soldiers had used, but the core principle was identical. Find white oak, not red oak, because the bark properties are different. Strip pieces of bark from the tree, hand-sized chunks that were dry enough to burn clean. Dig your hole about as deep as your head and as wide around as your shoulders could span. Start your fire with small kindling and let it burn down to coals. Stack the oak bark in a crisscross pattern like you're building a tiny log cabin made of bark instead of logs. The air spaces between pieces are critical because without oxygen flow, you just get smoldering smoke instead of clean burning coals. Place two sticks through the coals before you cover everything with dirt, one on each side of the hole. These become your air channels and they're absolutely essential to the technique working correctly. Cover the whole thing with the dirt you removed, pack it down firmly, then carefully pull out those two sticks you'll see a little smoke rise from each hole for a moment. Then it'll become almost invisible as the coals reach their steady burn. Sit over the fire with your blanket arranged around you so it touches the ground, creating an enclosed space. Make your little room, Yaga called it. The heat will rise directly into your space. Your body heat combines with the radiant heat from the coals below. In 20 degree cold, you can create a microclimate of 70 or 80 degrees under that blanket. 
go ahead and subscribe if you want more content like this. Real survival knowledge that works instead of gear reviews that empty your wallet. We're bringing back techniques that kept people alive before REI existed. Simon Kenton used this exact technique throughout his life on the frontier. In 1777, he saved Daniel Boone's life during an attack on Fort Boonesboro, then kept them both alive through a night where temperatures dropped below negative 30. The underground fire gave them heat without giving away their position to the Shawnee warriors still in the area. In 1778, those same Shawnee warriors captured Simon himself. He survived running the gauntlet nine times, a ritual that killed most prisoners after two or three runs. Later, when enemy scouts tried to track him through winter wilderness, they couldn't find him because his underground fires left almost no trace. No burn marks on the ground, no leftover wood, just packed earth that looked undisturbed. Throughout the 1780s and 1790s, Simon explored Ohio in winter months, when most men stayed close to settlements. He'd crouch for hours in sub-zero cold, waiting for dawn to hunt, sitting over his underground fire with snow falling around him. He described waking up many times with an inch or two of snow on his blanket, so warm inside his little room that he genuinely hadn't known it was snowing. This wasn't a case of medieval knowledge being passed down through European settlers who brought it to America. This was independent rediscovery. Simon Kenton and John Yeager figured out the same solution to the same problem that medieval soldiers had solved 600 years earlier. Same environmental pressure, same physical principles, same resulting technique, which raises the obvious question. If this technique is so effective, why does it work? What's actually happening underground that makes this so much better than a normal campfire? Scientific explanation. Modern combustion science explains what medieval soldiers and frontier trappers understood through experience. White oak bark has three properties that make it exceptional for underground fires. First, it produces roughly 8,200 BTUs per pound when burned which puts it almost in the same category as coal. Regular firewood produces somewhere between six and 7,000 BTUs per pound, so you're getting significantly more heat from the same weight of fuel. Second, white oak contains only about 3% resin content compared to 15 or 20% in pine or other softwoods. Resin is what produces thick smoke when wood burns. Less resin means cleaner combustion, which means minimal visible smoke. When white oak bark burns with sufficient oxygen, it achieves almost complete combustion. The carbon in the bark combines with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water vapor, but very little of the particulate matter that creates smoke. Third, the cellular structure of oak bark is extremely dense. When it burns down to coals, those coals are thick and long-lasting. A single load of properly prepared bark can produce coals that remain hot for 18 to 24 hours. That's not an exaggeration or frontier legend. That's actual burn time when the technique is executed correctly. But the bark alone doesn't explain why underground placement makes such a dramatic difference. The ground acts as insulation in ways that completely change fire dynamics. When you burn wood in open air, heat radiates in all directions. Much of that heat is lost to the atmosphere before it can warm anything useful. Underground, the earth contains the heat and reflects it upward. The fire burns 40% hotter underground than it would on the surface, using the exact same fuel. The air holes create what engineers call a Venturi effect. Cool air is drawn down through one hole, passes through the hot coals where it provides oxygen for combustion, and the heated exhaust rises through the second hole. This creates a continuous flow of oxygen that maintains steady combustion, rather than the fluctuating burn you get with surface fires affected by wind. Complete combustion is the key to minimal smoke. When wood doesn't burn completely, you get smoke as unburned particles are carried away with the heat. Underground fires with proper airflow achieve nearly complete combustion. The carbon dioxide produced is heavier than air, so instead of rising as visible smoke, it sinks into the soil and disperses. What little smoke does escape is filtered through earth and dissipates before it becomes visible. When you sit over this fire with a blanket arranged to touch the ground, you create a thermal trap. Your body produces heat through metabolism. The colds below produce heat through combustion. The blanket prevents both sources of heat from escaping. In negative 20 degree weather, you can maintain a microclimate of 70 to 80 degrees under that blanket. That's not just survival temperature, that's genuinely comfortable warmth. This explains why Simon Kenton could sleep through snowstorms. 
the snow landed on top of his blanket, which actually improved insulation by adding another layer between him and the cold air. The heat rising from below kept his core temperature stable all night. He wasn't toughing it out through miserable cold, he was actually warm. It also explains why medieval scouts could remain hidden from enemy patrols. From 10 feet away, you might notice disturbed earth if you were looking for it. From 50 feet, you'd see nothing unusual. No light, no smoke, no indication that someone was there. The technique is so effective at concealment that it's actually illegal in most modern contexts. And that brings us to an important warning about current applications. Modern application and warning. In 2025, this technique is prohibited in virtually all national parks and public lands in the United States. The reason isn't that it's dangerous when done correctly. The reason is that it's too effective at concealment. Park rangers and fire managers can't detect underground fires with standard patrols. They can't monitor them. They can't extinguish them if something goes wrong. An underground fire that isn't properly managed can smolder for days, potentially igniting roots and creating delayed forest fires. So let me be very clear about something. I'm teaching you this technique for educational purposes and for genuine survival situations where your life depends on staying warm. This is not something you do on a casual camping trip. This is not something you experiment with on public land where it's prohibited. This is knowledge you store in your mind for situations where the alternative is freezing to death. That said, when modern gear fails, and it absolutely does fail in extreme conditions, this technique still works exactly as it did 800 years ago. Battery-powered heaters die within six hours in sub-zero temperatures. Propane freezes solid at negative 44 degrees Fahrenheit. Sleeping bags rated for negative 20 degrees feel like lying in a refrigerator when actual temperatures drop below negative 30. The underground fire technique requires zero modern equipment. Everything you need exists in any forested area where white oak grows. The technique works regardless of how cold it gets, because combustion doesn't stop, just because the air temperature drops. The only limitations are whether you can find dry bark and whether the ground is soft enough to dig. Simon Kenton lived to be 81 years old, which was remarkable for a man who spent most of his life in conditions that killed people decades younger. He survived things that should have been fatal multiple times. Not because he was lucky, but because he understood principles that outlive empires and technological eras. Medieval soldiers proved these principles in the 14th century. American frontiersmen rediscovered them in the 18th century. Modern survival experts are learning them again in the 21st century. The knowledge survived because it was too valuable to disappear completely. It went underground, literally and figuratively, waiting for people who needed it badly enough to search for it. Some knowledge doesn't age. Some techniques don't become obsolete. The laws of thermodynamics and combustion don't change just because we invented Gore-Tex and lithium batteries. What you learn today is the same thing Simon Kenton learned from John Yeager in 1773. The same thing medieval soldiers taught each other during the Little Ice Age. The same understanding of fire, heat and survival that has kept people alive for eight centuries. No batteries required. No supply chain needed. Just knowledge applied correctly in the moment when you need it most. And now you have it too.